<laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to the second episode of my Hunter's Gambit read-along. I had a good response to my first video, but I can't wait to see how far we can take this. I hope all of you are enjoying it and are just as excited as I am. I will try to keep my voice clearer for this episode. As I keep VTubing and learn more about recording and editing, I'll hopefully keep making the quality of this show better and better. Thank you so much for staying with me during this beginning period. If any of you have any acting experience and can give me any advice, I'd love to get your help. Of course, I'm keeping water by my desk and learning to be a little bit less picky. Before, I was thinking that if I couldn't do a scene or a paragraph in a single shot, that I was somehow failing all of you. Now I know that I can do extra takes. Also, occasionally I have little jump cuts in there. Let me know if you're finding them distracting or if you're liking them. Thanks in advance for all of your help. Oh, and I do have one more bit of news that can't wait for the extra episode. May is Asian Heritage Month. In its honor, I will only be reading books by Asian authors. While I don't generally have a lot of time for reading anymore, I do have a few books that I've been looking for a reason to pick up. So, on my queue right now, are Light Novels 2 and 3 of the Wolf and Parchment series by Isuna Hasakura, Die on Your Feet by S.G. Wong, and maybe another run of Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan, just because the audiobook is a great popcorn read. Now, I have a few other books on my Kindle, but I'll see just how much reading time I end up getting this month, and whether or not I finish these first. Either way, I'll let you know what I'm reading in each post. Do you want to join me? Let me know what you'll be reading, or make some suggestions to me in the comments. Now, when we last left Kazunaha, she had just seen her sister attain her majority. In addition to gaining control of the family businesses, this also means that Himiko is the new matriarch of the Tanaka clan. <laughs> yes, a clan of two still counts as a clan. Kazunaha attempted to leave the gathering early, when she was accidentally injured by her axe as he entered the inn, to celebrate. Kazunaha pushed her way past him outside, unwilling to stay any longer. <laughs> and now, on with the show. Just let me pull out my book here. <laughs> and there we go. Perfect. Kazunaha sighed and walked into the alley. The blacksmith shed was there, as was the bench that was her destination. She sat down, gasping at the pain that blossomed as soon as she did. Lifting it, she started to massage it daintily. It didn't look that bad, just a bit of swelling that her rubbing seemed to clear. She listened to the silence of the night, broken once or twice by the door of the lucky koi opening and the general din rolling out. The noise assailed her senses each time. As the sound disappeared, a couple walked by the front of the alleyway. The woman was Kala, one of the villagers even more well-known for her wandering eye than Kazunaha was. The boy on her arm was much more interesting. A stranger, with darker skin and hair than even a corvid eye. His clothes, a dark shirt and jerkin with matching trousers, were old but serviceable. A landsman outfit, rather than sailor's digs. Kala led the man drunkenly around the corner towards her house. Kazunaha waited a moment before testing her leg. It seemed fine, so she walked to the wealth of the alley. The Koi's doors opened again, filling the quiet night with noise once more, and she hugged the shadows. In the alley across from her, a man stepped out. He gestured towards the men leaving the Koi. Kazunaha's eyes widened. These men were also strangers. Unlike Kala's boy, they looked rough, unshaven. Worse, they were wearing swords, and one, a thin brute of a man, was carrying a crossbow. She frowned. It was illegal to carry one in town, unless you were a guard or a hunter. The man from the alley gestured again, and all three walked past her spot. Kazunaha slipped further into the darkness of the wall's shadow, watching as they pulled their weapons free. The man with the crossbow and another man stayed to the shadows, following the couple. The other two ducked into a far street. The man with the crossbow glanced her way, and Kazuha gulped in relief when his gaze passed her by. She took a deep breath, peeking around the corner. If Kala were taking the stranger to her home, she would have let him down the second side street. 
The men were standing at slip, leaning in, hunting. They were planning to ambush them. She pulled back into the alley, across from the lucky koi, feeling like the air was too thick to breathe. It would be stupid of her to get involved. These men were better armed than she was, and skilled in the business of thuggery. She was one woman, and she didn't kid herself. She was fair to middling with her dagger. It was small, meant for protection against an unarmored assailant, and hardly a real weapon. She was lucky she was carrying it all today. Men grabbing her wasn't much of a problem, but sailors didn't always understand that no men know. Hmm, well the sheriff had been at the party. She glanced back at the koi, wrinkling her nose. The last she'd seen him, he'd been drinking the ale like water in the midday heat. She'd be lucky if he was still conscious. She peeked back around the corner. The men had disappeared into the street. Kazunaha's hand went to her dagger. Before she could talk herself out of it, Kazunaha stalked out of the alley, glad that the pain in her foot had disappeared. She took the second path in and ran silently down the thin side street that Kala and the thugs had avoided. Kala would have known that it would have been faster, but none of the strangers would. When she reached the boat swan's home, she crossed his yard, peeking around the corner. Surprisingly, most of the lights were off in the homes, and she wondered whether everyone was asleep or at the party. Kala's breathless laughter filled the streets as they pulled apart and continued walking. It took her a few moments to locate the two thugs, well hidden in the darkness afforded by the faint flames sparking in the uneven streetlights. Even if Kala and her boy had been sober, they wouldn't see the men until the last moment. As she watched, they came around the corner, their blades drawn. As they stepped into the light, their weapons shone, revealing pits so uneven that they almost looked toothed. Whoever these men were, they couldn't afford to do proper upkeep on their blades. Kala's boy yanked her to his side when the woman didn't stop fast enough. His hand was already on his weapon. Maybe he wasn't drunk as she thought. Kizumaha slipped into the street, stealing forward while she drew her dagger. She's changed her mind, the man in front told Kala's stranger. He nodded at the stranger without taking his eyes off him. Take him. Don't bang him up any worse than we have to. She won't be pleased if he isn't in good condition when she gets him back. The man at Kala's side drew two daggers. I won't go easily. Kala frowned at him and at the other strangers. Richie, are these men friends of yours? Richie ignored her as the two men dove in, intent to kill in their body language. He caught the blade of the first one with his own and stepped nimbly out of the way of the second attacker, who blundered into Kala, sticking close to Richie's side. She shrieked and squeezed him, as if only he could save her, but hampering her even more. Amazingly, he continued fighting, a dervish with a short blade in each hand. The third thug moved behind them, hoping to catch the man unawares. Kala got in his way, shrieking loud enough that Kazunaha's ears hurt. The thug tossed her to the side, but Richie, with little more than a glance behind him, elbowed his attacker in the face. Kazunaha blinked, realizing that she hadn't been needed at all. This man could handle himself in a battle, and he was way more competent than she was. Screw it, she may have said alive, but I'll take him back dead if I have to. Kazunaha heard the last man say as he stepped out of the shadows, aiming a loaded crossbow at the melee. Watch out, she called, breaking into a run. The man shot his crossbow, and then turned to her as he reloaded it. He didn't try to block her, and raised the weapon as he finished loading it. Staring the barrel of the weapon down, he cranked the weapon. Her eyes widened, and she dodged to the left while moving her blade to defend herself. The bolt whizzed by. Kazunaha dove toward him. Bile filled her throat as the blade slid between his ribs. Hot blood poured onto her hand, and she thanked her ancestors that she hadn't eaten much at the party. The man coughed, spittle burbling out of his mouth. He pushed her away, and Kazunaha fell back, leaving her weapon in his side. He reached for her, and she shivered, leaping forward to grab her knife again. It didn't come out when she tugged on it. She saw him draw his own knife and panicked, twisting the blade out and yanking as hard as she could. The knife made a popping sound as it slid out.
The man gasped, and his mouth bubbled over with black blood. It was pouring from the open wound as well. She could smell his blood. It wasn't sickening and dead like the scent that infused the slaughterhouse. It smelled sweet and heavy. A shiver ran down her spine, and she shook her head. She couldn't think about that now. The man's crossbow fell from his hands, and she kicked it away, turning to see if Richie was still alive. One of the boy's opponents had fallen, but he was slowing down against the other two. Worse, he was favoring his side. She ran up, abandoning all pretense of stealth. Kazunaha's arm tingled as her blade bounced off the other man's armor. She grit her teeth and took a step back, locking her hand around the weapon's handle. She wouldn't lose it again. The big man turned partially, keeping his eyes on his target and her. What's a weak bird like you doing? You made a bad decision getting involved. She snapped at him. It's never a bad decision to help someone. The man scoffed. We ain't trying to kill him. Then what? The man smiled. He was fast enough that she almost missed the blade coming for her belly. Kazunaha leapt back, avoiding the blow. Stepping in close, she aimed her blade at his shoulder. The man hit her arm carelessly, and her blade skittered on the cobblestones. What, you don't know how to actually fight? he said with a grin. Let me school you, before you hurt yourself. No, let me, a voice said from behind him. Her opponent stiffened, his eyes widening, and he took a pained breath, coughing. Blood bubbled up around his lips, and his eyes opened in panic, as if he couldn't draw a breath. She heard a sound faintly like a whistle, and as he fell, she saw the stranger behind him, yanking two long, thoroughly soaked blades out of the band's back. Kazunaha looked and saw that all of the others were lying on the ground, pools of blood widening around them. The men were all dead, and Kala was gone. She lifted her eyes back in time to see the stranger's eyes widen in surprise. Glory of Christanel, the stranger said. You're a woman! Well, this was a much shorter chapter than the first one, and a hell of a lot more of exciting, too. Let me just take the book down here. Okay, I admit that when I wrote this chapter, it originally included all of chapter 3. Fortunately, while I was editing, I realized that this was a better place to end it, even if it meant that this chapter was a bit shorter than I prefer. Also, this is one of those chapters that took the longest to work out for me. See, while I've been told that my fighting scenes are unusually clear, I can 100% confirm that they aren't so in my first draft. I can't see a battle, and reading battles bore me to tears. Fortunately, one of my quotes is that you can edit shit into gold, but you can't edit a blank page. So these scenes usually end up taking me two to three times as long to edit, just to make sure that they're clear, while still being exciting and realistic. They also take a long time because while I love weapons, I don't usually research injuries and how quickly they take you down. Which honestly means that it's editing chapters like this that probably makes CSIS, the Canadian version of the FBI, put me on some sort of list for my Google searches while they wait to see if my city suddenly has a new psychotic killer popping up before they think to ask, oh wait, is she also looking up comma splices and popular Asian fantasy? <sighs> she goes on the second list. <laughs> At any rate, I really hope that the work I put into this chapter comes through. Although, reading through it, I can see a few places where I wouldn't mind editing it, and cleaning up the language a bit. Ah, well, that may be a goal for the e version after I finish researching community views on editing already published novels. <laughs> oh, and I think that'll be it for today. I hope you enjoyed this chapter, and I can't wait to see all of you for the third chapter coming on next Wednesday, May 12th. Remember to share this video with your friends, and like and subscribe if you haven't already. <laughs> Bye! <laughs>